speaking today is Lemma Coffee, a general secretary of Unite Union, largest union in the UK with over 1.5 million workers uh, countrywide, um, with staff of Cambridge University also amongst that number. Um, he's going to be talking today about what unionists and students can be doing to try and improve the economic situation and lead to what he sees as better policy, policy decisions for the country. So could we have a very warm round of applause for Mr. Lemmerkoff? Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the invite to Cambridge. You know, I always had an inkling that one day I'd make it here. Um, <laughs> And Christoph, thank you, and Max, I welcome this chance to speak to you about some of the longer-range political issues facing our country and the world today, the stuff that lies beyond the day-to-day -day headlines, although I will have a word to say about a couple of contemporary questions too. I'm speaking, of course, to our leaders, maybe our rulers, uh, of a generation from now. So it's a privilege to have a chance to shape your impressionable minds. Hopefully they're still impressionable. Because I want to use this opportunity to maybe plant a few seeds, which, who knows, may flower years from now and help make our country a better place. If I'd been speaking 25 years ago to your equivalents in the 1980s, I would have been speaking to people, many of them at least, who we now know would have gone on to make a huge heap of money, whilst at the same time helping to drive the economy off the cliff. That's not being, me being too harsh. The generation of the 1980s imbibed to a large extent the ideology of the time. And if my predecessor, Ernie Bevan, had spoken to Cambridge students in the 1930s, he would have been addressing people who would perhaps have gone off to fight to defend democracy in Spain during the Civil War, or who planned the post-war world which emerged from the defeat of fascism. So let me start with a basic question, which should be asked of every young person. What sort of society do you want to live in? What difference do you want to make to the world? Because there's no doubt that you will make a difference. You have the background, the education, the life chances to leave your mark on society and on the world at large. The choice is, what sort of difference? If some of you here just want a big house in the country and to drive a Porsche, then fine, good luck to you. But for me, that is as cramped a vision of anything one could find on a mythical benefit street. I'd sooner address those who have broader horizons. How do you want to use your skills, your intelligence, your opportunities, your intellect to change the world? Of course, there is no one answer to that question. People can contribute in different ways. If you're researching a cure for cancer, for example, or designing the technologies of tomorrow, politics may not seem such a great matter. But there is no hiding place from the big questions. We are all, in large measure, interdependent. What happens on a broader campus, beyond our immediate specialisms, affects us all. So let's set out some of the problems. As I mentioned, in the 1930s, many students at Cambridge and elsewhere saw defeating the menace of fascism as the course they could devote themselves to. And many took that devotion to the point of sacrificing their lives. The far right are still with us today, now, as then, trying to speculate on the consequences of economic crisis. But the difficulties we face today are different, less stark, happily but more complicated, perhaps. I would put my central concerns this way. We live in a society where, over the last generation, every institution that stands between the individual and the market has been diminished or stripped away. Trade unions, local governments, a public sector in the economy, even the churches, have all been reduced, marginalised or broken up 
by the onward march of neoliberal market-first ideology. The effect has been to bring into sight the reality of Mrs. Thatcher's famous claim that there is no such a thing as society. People have been reduced to individual economic actors, each and every one going to the market alone, measured solely by their spending power. In this society without a society, people exist as consumers alone, or maybe investors if you have the resources. Producer is almost a dirty word, as if we could all consume without creating anything at all. Of course, if you don't have an income, or much of one, then you're, you account for little in the marketplace and are treated with scorn in the political and the media arena, just like those forced to live on welfare are being treated today. And as for people as citizens, well, this has come to be seen as almost a quaint concept, as voter turnout in elections falls and the capacity of communities to exercise any control over their circumstances is stripped away. Cynicism steps in to that vacuum. Some will certainly respond by saying, well, some of that may be true, but at least we live in a more prosperous society where growth has given most people more choices. Now, obviously, those arguments would have been sounded much better in 2007 before the bankers crash than they do today. But still, they need addressing. Let me start with inequality. There is an abundance of research showing that the more unequal a society is, the worse things are for nearly everyone. Health is worse, antisocial behaviour, educational outcomes. Over the last 30 years, inequality between the rich and the rest has widened dramatically. The very richest people in Britain, the very richest 1%, have as much wealth as 60% of the population. And a recent report by Oxfam came up with a startling uh, account. The earnings of the top 100 billionaires in the world, the earnings in 2012, would have eradicated extreme world poverty. Just think of that. The earnings, not the wealth, the earnings. It is as though we've created an almost medieval elite in our midst, and the trend growth shows no signs of reversing. The flip side of this coin is that the share of our wealth that is used to pay wages of workers in Britain is shrinking year by year. 65% of our national income went on workers' wages when Mrs Thatcher came to power. Today, it's just... 53%, and those economists amongst you will tell you that this is a dramatic drop. Over the last few years, real wages have been falling for most people in work. The longest drop, the largest drop, since Queen Victoria was on the throne in the 1870s. 45 consecutive months, wages have declined in value. Of course, this can only happen in a society where the power of trade unionism and of collective bargaining, always the best defence against inequality, have been radically reduced. Money follows power. And without redressing that deliberately created imbalance of power in the workplace by re-empowering workers' organisations, wage inequality will only widen. That's why trade union freedoms are critical in any civilised society. Of course, wages are only one measure of our unequal society. Housing is another. Why in a society of our wealth and development is it so hard to offer everyone a decent roof over their heads? Why? The answer is, of course, that every government in the last 40 years has failed to stimulate the house building that is needed to provide decent homes for everybody in Britain. The failure to build council housing is a national scandal that has negatively impacted on the life chances of not only the worst off in Britain for generations, but also others in society as they seek 
an independent path in life. Over 40% of former council houses are now in private hands and are being rented out at extortionate rents. So much for the Thatcher Revolution, which was going to create a home-owning democracy. Spivs and speculators and greedy landlords have put pay to that. All too often, people are caught in housing traps in the private rented centre without being able to have the money, for example, uh, for a deposit, to move from one property <coughs> to another. So it's good that the Labour Party is at last addressing all of this and talking of building one million homes over a parliament and forcing developers to release land to be built on. It's not rocket science. A huge unmet demand for houses, hundreds of thousands of building workers on the dole, and masses of unused building materials. A five-year-old child could join those dots together. It seems it's only a neoliberal economic system that can't. Where will the money come from, I hear people say, using the billions tied up in pension funds? would allay the government's fear of borrowing and meet businesses' desire to invest. The funds themselves are clamouring and crying out for such opportunities. And banning the highly profitable surge for tax loopholes by the super-rich, ending tax avoidance in effect, would create a huge stimulus. And let's give new rights to those who rent property in the private sector. The UK currently is the most deregulated private rental market in Europe, and some of the stories that we hear are heartbreaking and horrendous. Because the point of this is, if you have the prospect of a decent job and a decent home, it gives you a platform for life. With that security, everyone can start to spread their wings, contribute to the wider society, plan for the future deploy their talents. That's why I say Britain needs three things. Jobs, homes, hope. And the greatest of these is hope. The optimism that can infuse a country, that can drive out by degrees fear and cynicism, that can make society much more than the sum of its parts. It springs out of the first two, yes, but it is the hardest to guarantee. Roosevelt, FDR, said that Hoover's Republicans were swept from office in 1932 election in the midst of the Great Depression because in disaster you have held out no hope. Remember land of hope and glory? Today we have little of either. What hope is there in a land of food banks? And what glory when a family of a soldier who has died for their country could be forced from their homes by the bedroom tax. You can't introduce hope by decree. And it doesn't flow automatically out of a paycheck or bricks and mortar. And some things you can't determine, you can't control. You know, to read some newspapers... You'd think that trade union barons had the capacity to stop the rain from falling, if only. But there is one missing element which does reside within the sphere of public policy. It is the question of power. There's nothing like being powerless to make you pessimistic. And hope can spring from the knowledge that your views are taken seriously. That you can influence things around you, from the workplace to the government. We have lost that sense of our power in recent times. Democracy has withered. As I mentioned earlier, the only recognised power in our system today is the power of the purse. Indeed, if the free market is looked on as an act of God or nature, with which ordinary mortals may not interfere, then what is there left for politicians to do? What the country needs is a politics that offers choices, where votes make a real difference, and where you do not end up with more of the same 
whatever the outcome of a general election is. For too long that's been the case. I'm not saying that there's been no differences and it wouldn't have mattered who won the last election. That would be wrong. But the differences have narrowed enormously. Nor is it the case that people aren't interested in politics. Tell that to the millions who marched against the Iraq war. Or more recently, the students who stood up for their rights against tuition fees. Or to UK Uncut, which has done great work in highlighting the tax avoidance by big business. Unacceptable at any time. Criminal at a time of austerity. On all these issues and more, people feel strongly. They want to make their voices heard and to shape the national agenda. But too often, they are confronted by a more or less united political elite, which is bipartisan when the chips are down. Voting for the Iraq war, betraying promises on tuition fees, and trimming tax policy for the needs of big corporations. We need real choices, and politicians who reflect the diversity of public opinion, not the narrow assumptions of a global elite. That's why I have to suppress a shudder down my spine when I hear the talk of a Lib Lab government after the next general election, another coalition. Of course, I don't know what the results of that election will be. I'm hoping for an outright Labour victory. And it's up to the politicians to deal with the result that the British people hand to them. But for those of us who believe we need a real alternative and a fresh start, the thought of Nick Clegg standing on the threshold of Downing Street again with his arm around Ed Miliband this time, rather than David Cameron, is not one to set the pulse racing. Because I believe Clegg does not represent a new kind of politics, but instead the last gasp of the old neoliberal consensus. He is an orange book Lib, Lib Dem who swears by the free market and by cuts in social spending. His pitch is, whoever you vote for, you get me. And he will ally himself with whoever it is to hand to keep the country bogged down in the same failed consensus. Ed Miliband is starting to offer the different perspective we need, taking on the energy giants, asking the rich to pay a bit more in tax, building homes, tackling inequality. The last thing the country needs, in my opinion, is genuine radical <coughs> laborism filtered through the soggy Lib Dem sieve. I would hope that under those circumstances, Labour is bold enough to form a minority government, set out its programme, and dare MPs from the failed coalition parties to vote it down. And if the Tories do, then go to the country again in an election that would offer the starkest choice as to what sort of society we want to be. You know, one of the most shameful of the betrayals by this government has been its treatment of the National Health Service. David Cameron vowed to preserve the NHS intact with no more unnecessary reforms. He lied. And Nick Clegg, of course, has allowed him to get away with it. Enough to make any voter cynical about politicians. So we've seen one of the country's most treasured institutions gutted and sold off. This isn't even privatisation by stealth. There's nothing stealthy about it. It's robbery in plain sight. Bit by bit, the NHS is being turned into just another business, like energy or other utilities, run for private profit by those who see gain in pain. For the Tories and the Lib Dems, competition is more important than curing. Their agenda is to let their business friends make money out of health. No surprise. Since 230 MPs and peers, mostly but not all Conservatives, have personal interests in private healthcare companies. They include Andrew Lansley, Health Secretary until recently, whose office has been funded by Care UK. The present Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, who is taking cash from a US hedge fund with private healthcare interest. And MP Mark Simons, who has received £50,000 a year from Circle Health for just 10 hours advice a month. 
No wonder Oliver Letman, the cabinet policy chief, once boasted that the NHS would not exist within five years of a Tory election victory. The best of it is we know that private health care doesn't work. In the USA, an overwhelmingly private health system delivers worse outcomes while spending a greater share of GDP. But you know what? It does make some people very, very wealthy indeed. And let's not forget, no one voted for this change. There's no mandate. No one voted for health decisions to be handed over to a government-appointed monitors who recently declared that two cancer surgeries in the west of England could not combine because the care improvements that it would have brought did not outweigh the loss of competition. So here is a vital issue which people feel they have lost control of. They've not been consulted. In fact, they've been deceived. And when they've protested, they've just been ignored. I don't believe that we have any obligation to just stand aside and wait for the next election while well, this government does its worst. Nye Bevan once said that the NHS would only exist as long as there are people prepared to fight for us. And that's why I'm announcing here tonight that Unite is launching a new leverage campaign in defence of the NHS. We will fight for it. Some of you may have heard a bit about leverage, may have read a bit about it. Contrary to what you may have read, it's not about turning up outside directors' houses and demonstrating. It's about putting pressure on employers and others to face up to their corporate and social responsibilities. By saying that there is nowhere to hide if you want to trample over your workforce or the public. We will go to your clients and your customers. We will be there to take the gloss off your PR events. We will talk to your pension funds and financial institutions that hold your stock. In short, you will be accountable. And so in the case of the NHS, <coughs> will be the politicians accountable that have given the green light for this attack on our health care. Well, let me be clear. This will not target health professionals or premises used by patients under any circumstances. This is about defending the NHS from the predators. And it is the predators we will target, not in the interests of trade unions, but in the interests of the whole community. What society needs is more community leverage over politicians and business. And I'm proud that Unite can give a lead in providing that. That leads me back to hope. It can't be delivered in a pre-wrapped package. It has to grow out of society. <coughs> a democratic society that offers opportunities to all, that ensures every citizen a decent guarantee of security and avenues to expand their talents and to play their part. All of you here can be pretty confident that you will have those opportunities, and I don't begrudge you that. All I ask is that you remember that there are many in today's Britain, let alone today's world, who do not have those life chances. Happily, you will not be asked to shoulder a rifle and go to Spain to defend democracy. But I hope you set your sights higher than the loads of money generation. Whatever your course, do not just take society as it is. Don't be content to leave the world as you found it. It was Karl Marx who said, philosophers only interpret the world. The point is to change it. You can be the people who renew our economic values. You can reinvigorate democracy. You can banish hunger and homelessness. Those are the causes worthy of Cambridge University students. It was one of your most famous graduates, John Maynard Keynes, who famously said, in the long run, we are all dead. 
So it's what we do when we aren't dead that matters. And whatever you do, please make a difference. Thank you. Socialist for a newspaper and a Labour Party member, and um, I should mention I'm running for NUS delegate um, on behalf of Kusu. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Um, despite uh, what I wanted to say, basically, is um, union membership. Um, I've looked it up this morning; it's very low, despite the um, the, the massive crisis. Um, and I think there's there's in some respects a, a big crisis of confidence amongst union members. Like, I mean, one of the things we've seen in Cambridge um, recently, we've had uh, the lecturers' strikes um, and other university staff, and hardly anybody turns up to the picket lines. Um, even some union members um, don't go in. And, and there's, there's very low confidence in the success of a strike. Um, and I think, I think this, this com low confidence has a, has a context. Um, I mean, yeah, um, one thing... Um, I mean, one, one thing that's happened recently, uh, events like the, the Grangemouth um, um, incident, where there was uh, the, the attempt to, um, to uh, attack the workers, like it's happening all over the country at Grangemouth. And, um, and the union um, unite, unfortunately, although at the beginning the, um, the workers went on strike, they called for nationalisation of the plant, um, the um, unite... Um, fell over backwards and capitulated, and I don't see how that can, um, how that can help um, build confidence in the run-up to, to the general strike that you've been calling for um, over the last couple of years. Um, and I think leverage relates to this too, um, essentially. Um, you know, it's, it's all very well like in, like in the INEOS scandal, um, not scandal, strike. Um, um, pushing for the bosses to, to give, give um, concessions, but in the end so they don't. Mind, so I yeah, I'll finish there. The um, question is not a law speech. Uh, fine, I'll finish there. Well look, Mo, you've raised this issue about confidence, and you're right to do that. Uh, my experience uh, tells me that when working people are confident, anything can happen. In fact, the history of not only Britain, and the labour movement, I mean, the history of the world tells us that. We've seen during the Arab Spring, dictators brought down by people power. We've seen perhaps one of the strongest and most powerful prime ministers in the history of our nation, Margaret Thatcher, brought down over the poll tax by people power. One of the most popular prime ministers we've ever had, Tony Blair, his demise can be traced back to the Iraq war. When people powered, millions came out onto the streets and said, not in our name. And um, power and confidence are critical. Uh, and indeed, that was a point I was trying to make in my speech, that um, you have to raise the consciousness of working people and make them feel that they can have an impact. You say, well, people don't turn out on picket lines, and there's a, a low... Um, response. That's because there's a low confidence. Very often you get engaged in issues where people don't feel that they can make a difference. And therefore, what's the point? <coughs> and it's the responsibility of leaders, and all of us in this room are leaders. And many of you will go on to be politicians, captains of industry, <coughs> leading players within society. And you have a role of, to actually raise the consciousness and the aspirations of ordinary people. That's what trade unions do. Now, Mo, of course, I see you were selling socialist appeal uh, outside, so I know what your political uh, views are. That's why you've made a rather fundamental error over Grangemouth. I'm conscious of 
those colleagues on the left of the movement who call for nationalisation and occupation and uh, you know the creation of the uh, beginning of the uh, transitional programme from the Fourth International in order to bring down capitalism. But it's wrong for you to make judgments about Grangeman when you don't understand the facts behind Graham Grangeman because nobody fell backwards even though the media attempted to kind of display it as uh, a, uh, a defeat and a humiliation. There's nothing humiliating, I said this on TV a number of times, there's nothing humiliating in representing the views of ordinary working people. But there were stark lessons to learn from Grangeman, brutal lessons, brutal lessons that need to be learned by the Westminster government and by the Scottish government. And incidentally, my discussions with Alex Salmond, the First Minister in Scotland, uh, demonstrate to me that he is learning the lessons. And the lessons were this, that such an important national asset <coughs> Uh, that a nation has. And remember, if Grange Mount would have closed, the whole of Scotland would have come to a standstill. Northern, the north of England and Northern Ireland would have been terribly affected. And it's in the hand of private capital, a multi-billionaire, a single individual who lives on a £137 million yacht off the south of France, owns this national asset and effectively blackmailed everybody. So there are lessons to learn there, Mark. And the real message for me to all of you, because our lords and masters would have us believe sometimes that there is nothing we can do. That you might go for a drink in a bar and something will be on the telly, something will have happened, and they'll say, well, isn't it a disgrace? Isn't it terrible what that's happened? But what can you do about it? There is no alternative. How many times have we heard that? The truth is they try to debilitate us. And so my message is don't allow people who rule us to debilitate you. Because the power of ordinary people coming collectively together, especially the youth of our nation, is incredibly powerful and can change dramatically uh, the situation. That's what we try to do in my union. We respond to our members, we give lead to our members, we stand shoulder to shoulder with our members. We've created community branches so that those who are not in work can become part of our family. Because as these cuts cut in from the government, and remember that, the 60% of the cuts are still to come. Millions of people are becoming disenfranchised, nowhere to turn. They believe no one speaks on their behalf. So the concept and the idea of raising people's consciousness is important. Don't be debilitated. And let's make certain that we work with one another for the greater good. That's what trade unions are all about. And that's why I would urge you, Mo, not to be too deflected by uh, a political idealism, which is all very fine, but doesn't relate to the real world that people live in. And to work as hard as you can to raise that consciousness of working people and to solidify that solidarity that is so important to everyone. Next question. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming to speak to us. Um, I was wondering, I want to ask you uh, more about your views on the rich. Um, Honoré de Balzac said, behind every great fortune lies a forgotten crime. Do you believe that there is a noble way to make a fortune or not? <laughs> now that's the type of question I would have expected from Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I don't, it, it's really about the type of society that we wish to live in. When we live in a society where 1% of the richest people in Britain own 60% of um, uh, of the wealth, then in my mind there's something clearly wrong there. Something has gone a kilter. Every look around you, everything we're wearing, the seat you're sitting on, the building you're uh, we're, we're meeting in, uh, the bicycles that you might ride, the, the 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 car that you get into, everything is made by working people. That's the real wealth of our nation. When we produce things, and it's working people that produce them. And in the context of the division of that wealth is 
really lies at the heart of the type of society that you want. Now, I'm not against rich people per se, uh, but of course I am of a belief that wealth should be properly divided and fairly divided. And the societies that we live in should be developed through that wealth in whatever way that needs to be done, whether that be through taxation. Not a week goes by at the moment whereby major companies, major multinational companies are exposed as not paying any tax. The super rich don't pay any tax. Now that is evidently wrong. So on the one hand, I don't have mind them having wealth, but I just want that wealth to be properly used for the good of society in which we live. And it is outrageous when some of the biggest names in our high streets and our society simply don't play a role. Some of you may have seen a panorama program just recently about Amazon. Now here's this incredibly successful uh, uh, business uh, created through entrepreneurial skills and those skills you have to encourage but they don't pay any tax. Three billion pounds worth of uh, business done in Great Britain and virtually no tax pay. And Panorama demonstrated how they treat their workers in their, uh, in their warehouses who are picking the, uh, the goods that we all go online to get. It's outrageous. Now that is criminal. And the kind of usage of that type of... Um, Of, uh, that might be the dean there, but, um, <laughs> the usage of that type of, um, of, of uh, accumulation of wealth is criminal. So for me, it's about trying to deal with what is real in life. You know, we live in a consumer society, all of us want better choices. But we also live in a Britain that is becoming more and more and more divided. I would argue that this government is divisive tries to divide unemployed workers from working people, you know, the so-called strivers and, and shirkers. It tries to divide able-bodied people from uh, disabled. It tries to divide public sector workers from private sector workers, north from south, you know, creating also the concept of uh, a black from white. You know, it was this government that sent these, uh, the, 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 these wagons around London telling immigrants to go home and inciting race, racial violence, absolutely disgraceful. Now that's not the type of society I don't think, I don't think any of us want. So my point is you have to try and work out how to develop a society where yes, of course, skills and talents are rewarded uh, and people can live the good life, but not in isolation to everything else that's going on. And, um, uh, the concept of forgotten crime as well, you know, that's uh, an interesting concept, I, say, I dare say, because I'm not, I'm not a royalist, um, uh, I'm a republican, and uh, you know, if there was a vote tomorrow, I'd do away with the monarchy, but I suppose there are a number of history students amongst you, and if you go back in history, well, you'll see how various people became kings and earls and dukes, and why, you know, some people didn't, and uh, you can make your own judgments whether there was crimes committed. <laughs> yeah. um, hi, my name is Michael. I'm not running for any less delegate, but I do have a question. Um, so obviously following the Falkirk scandal, there have been a lot of questions asked about the relationship of the trade unions and political parties, in particular the Labour Party. And I wanted to ask you if you're happy to defend what was the status quo, namely the union paying membership dues for members <coughs> without asking them. Um, and how you see your union's relationship with the Labour Party changing going forward, and how you reconcile that with your desire to see a more muscular presence for the trade unions within politics. Okay, a couple of points there, Michael. I mean, it, uh, just let me clarify the question. You, you mentioned the Falker scandal, as it's become uh, known in, in the media. Of course, the truth is there was no scandal. The truth is that nobody did anything wrong. The Labour Party now accept that. More importantly, Police Scotland have accepted it twice now. Uh, so there was no scandal, but I take your point about the Falkir question. And can I defend 
if you meant, can I defend the fact that <coughs> the Falkirk were joined up without their knowledge? Well, as I've just said, that didn't happen. It, it, trust me on this. 88 Unite members joined um, Falkirk constituency. They all knew they were joining Falkirk constituency because they had a personal letter from me. So the accusation and the media hysteria that was created at that time was based on lies, but hey, you know, why, why, why let the truth get in the way of a good story? Um, well, I think the other point you were making, I think, is, 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 is much more central. In Unite, um, one million of our members pay the political levy, pay into a political levy, and Unite affiliates all of those one million to the Labour Party. That's the status quo. And if you're asking me, can I justify that? The answer is no, I can't. Uh, which is precisely why when Ed Miliband raised these issues, even though I believe he was wrong in the manner he did it, he was a knee-jerk reaction, and he was completely wrong in any criticism that he levelled at Unite. Nevertheless, the issue about whether individual trade union members uh, should just automatically be affiliated to the Labour Party without, without the, them having a say in the matter is a legitimate question and one that we took up immediately in Unite. And uh, when I examined it, it was very evident to me that I couldn't justify it because our own internal, um, our own internal polling tells us that it's only about 55% of our members actually vote Labour. So out of the million, maybe 400 and odd thousand don't even vote Labour. <coughs> so the idea that they are affiliated with the Labour Party, in my opinion, is, uh, is not defendable. And that's why um, in the process of the debates and the discussions that have been taking place with the Labour Party, I've been the one person that has welcomed the debates. I disagreed with the status quo. I believe change was necessary. And my own union's executive, actually next week, will make a decision on our affiliation fees. We currently affiliate one million members. I think, uh, even though I'd ask you not to whisper this too much outside of this building, because I don't want the media to find out about this just yet. <laughs> um, I think you can safely say that there will be a fairly dramatic reduction uh, taken by our executive next week. Uh, sorry, and how do I how do I reconcile all of this with uh, well? Remember, the Labour Party is our party. Uh, the trade unions at the beginning of the last century created the Labour Party, a party of Labour. Uh, you know, it, it, it says what it is on the can. And the reason for that was that you know, when again know this from, from your own studies, the advent of the Industrial Revolution brought with it new trade unions, general trade unions, union workers coming together to defend themselves against the power of capital. <coughs> and within the political arena, the voice of workers was primarily at that time through the Liberal Democrats and uh, through the Liberals. Um, but it wasn't the true voice. And so at the beginning of the last century, the uh, trade unions said, we need to create our own party. We need to create a party of labor that can argue uh, our case and our wishes and aspirations in parliament. And that's when the Labour Party was created. It's our party. So of course, I want to try to make certain that the values that uh, are uh, essential to trade unionism. And those values, I mean, I won't talk about fairness and justice and decency and equality because lots of people have those values. But the value of solidarity, of collectivism, is a preserve, uh, <coughs> is central to trade unionism. And that's why we need to get it back into the Labour Party because over the period of so called New Labour, that <coughs> Uh, ideal, those values of solidarity and collectivism have dissipated. And so um, I would like to reinsert them back into the party. And that's what the democratic debate that is taking place in the party is all about. Yes, 
I'm, I'm Tom, I'm a member of the Labour Party and uh, the GMB union. And it kind of relates to that because um, I joined the GMB, uh, I've got, I'm not at work. So it's a lot more for their kind of social campaigning. But that makes me uh, a tiny minority among young people. Um, so I was, uh, for example, when I, um, I'm in my first year, when I went through the Freshers' Fair, there was a stall for every political party under the sun. But there was no union yeah. tables. So I was wondering uh, <coughs> if there's anything that you're planning to do or would support doing to convince young people to get into that uh, union politics as well as just party political politics. Yeah, Tom, you make a great, great point. And, you know, um, <coughs> my union, my union, union was formed by bringing together two pretty big unions, the Transform General Workers Union and Amicus, only um, six years ago now. And, um, so we are still, in many respects, a fledgling union. And are we perfect? Far from it. We've got lots and lots of things to do. And I mentioned to Mark before about what we did in terms of community branches. So we're now welcoming yet people who are, who, who are not in way in, into our union. The point about not having union stalls at, at pressure programmes is a great one. In fact, I've got my director of education uh, at, at the back with me, Jim Mallett, and, um, we are currently looking at all kinds of different ways to uh, uh, get um, young people involved, not only involved in our union, but involved in general. Uh, you, that is one point that we will certainly take on board. Now, you know, whether we can facilitate, because I do know that we turn up at a number of universities, we try to have a relationship with the NUS, we try to support student activities and student movements. I addressed uh, London's uh, Young Labour uh, only last month um, in order to talk, because it, this, this view that of oh, young people are not interested in politics is nonsense. You proved this tonight. Of course, people, young people are involved, uh, are interested in politics. But of course, there's also this void, this gap, this pessimism, cynicism, of, the type of political systems we have. And I, um, uh, tomorrow, yeah, I know. tomorrow I'm addressing our young, uh, our young members conference in Eastbourne, um, where I want to know from them what they want. Not some old fuddy-duddy like me telling them what they should be doing, but them telling me. You see, you might find this difficult to believe, but I can remember, I almost remember when I was your age. And, what I wanted, I had, my life choices at that time were, were fantastic. You know, there was lots of jobs around. I had plenty of jobs to pick up. When I was involved, I was encouraged to get involved in all kinds of things. I'm a child of the 60s, so the Vietnam War revolution was in the air everywhere. In music, in dress, in social conscience. And so it was easy for me to kind of get involved because I was inspired by things. And that's what we need now from young people. We need, that's why I accepted this invitation, because I want to hear your views and thoughts and ideas and criticisms. Because of course you should criticise your young people. Don't believe what your, your, your masters tell you. There might be a few of them here, so forgive me for saying that. But don't just take it as read, what they tell you, what you should be doing, what you should be taking. Challenge all the time. Challenge the status quo all the time. Because that way is the only way that the voice of young people can be heard. And certainly in my union, uh, our, our door is wide open for those type of thoughts. We have, we have young uh, uh, member committees in all our regions. We have a national young members committee. We've just, um, since I became general secretary, there's a seat on our executive, which is, you know, was like the board of directors, it runs our union and there's a seat now for young people. So we are constantly looking at that. And I'll tell you one, something else I'm, I've done. And it's a huge, huge, very ambitious uh, uh, thing. But I want uh, to go into every school in the UK and speak to 15 year olds every single year in order to explain to them what trade unions and what trade unions are. Now, I think the Sun newspaper accused me of wanting to recruit all these young, impressionable children to 
the union. It isn't about joining the union. It's about uh, making certain that as people enter uh, adulthood and as they leave um, you know, school, whether it's to go on to further education or whether it's to go into the world of work, they at least know what trade unions are. We shouldn't have to do that. You know, that should be part of the curriculum. Trade unions are the largest by far voluntary organisation in our society. And yet they're not taught in any of our subjects. So we want to do that so that young people at least know. When I was a young kid in Liverpool, 15 and 16, everyone knew what a trade union was. And okay, Liverpool was a kind of, I suppose, trade union city. But everybody knew what trade unions were. If I was to go back to my home city now, and I was 15 and 16 years old, so I'd get shocked. Same as I would everywhere else. People are not sure about what trade unions are. They read about all the trouble they cause and all the strikes that they have. They're not sure what it is. So that's what we're going to do, because of course, it's almost self-evident, Tom, that if any organisation cannot facilitate young people, then it will wither on the vine. Hi, I'm Sarah, and thanks for the speech. Um, I was just wondering, in regards to the language uh, program, how exactly you want to reform the NHS. Um, broadly speaking, I too disagree with the reforms the Tories have taken, and I've got personal experience because my dad's a healthcare professional, and he's trying to deal with this. Um, but do you not think there are ways, in a new, innovative way? of navigating um, between competition and also pursuing social goals? Yeah, I think one thing's certain. Uh, the National Health Service, did it need reforming? Absolutely. In fact, huge organisations always need uh, reform. Um, are there better ways to do things? Are there better ways to get value for money? Absolutely. And there are, we should always be seeking it. I think unfortunately what's happened with the Health and Social Care Bill is that the National Health Service is effectively being privatised in front of our very eyes. 70% of all elements that have gone out to tender have, have, um, have gone into the private sector. Now, just ask yourself the question, why is a private company <coughs> interested in the National Health Service? Well, the same reason that they're interested in any other sector of the economy, to make profit. That's why healthcare companies exist. And of course, healthcare companies link in then with health insurance companies who make massive amounts of profit. And it's, in a way, um, you know, I get angry that if this was happening in France now, if what's happening here in the UK was happening in France, we have a very good health service then there would be riots on the streets. And yet we appear to simply being allowing it to happen. Back to the question, the point I was making before about the, um, you know, debilitating us. There's nothing we can do. People feeling, well, you know, you just have to wait for the next election, perhaps. So what we've decided to do is, because if you go to people and say, Right, let's all rally, let's all go out on strike, let's all kind of uh, protest uh, so that the government changes its position completely on the National Health Service. Um, people won't believe that it's feasible. People think, well, that, that, you know, it's all very noble, but it's not going to work. Whereas if you concentrate on uh, the uh, localities, because this privatisation is taking place in a salami type fashion, then you can rally support. Let me give you an example that I, I, I picked up uh, talking with some American colleagues just the other day. The, in New York, there's just been an election of a new mayor, a very radical um, uh, mayor, the most left-wing uh, mayor that uh, any, uh, uh, any American city has ever elected. In New York, 13 hospitals are closed down. 13 hospitals have been closed. But the people who had run his campaign were telling me, it was no good us arguing about, well, 13 hospitals have closed down, because people said, yeah, and, you know, what, what can we do about it? Nothing. But during the course of the election, there was a maternity unit closing down in one of uh, New York's boroughs, I think it might 
would have been the Bronx or Brooklyn. Uh, a maternity ward was in the process of closing down. And they locked into that. And tens of thousands of people came out onto the streets to defend it. And we've had <coughs> examples of that in our, own, uh, in our own country. You look at Lewisham, the closure of Lewisham Hospital, 25,000 people came out onto the streets of Lewisham. Those of you that know London will know that 25,000 people in a borough in London, they actually filled the place because it was local and centralised. And so our leverage strategy is to target local areas and to bring to the attention of the local people and to link in with, with uh, student organisations, with direct action groups, with senior citizens, with faith organisations, with community organisations, to try and raise a consciousness about what's happening over a particular issue and to make certain that these vultures who are seeking to kind of pick up this way are exposed for who they are so that they are challenged in the rest of the work that they do. <coughs> now, that's the only way that we know how to fight back and to organise. But the point you make about is there an alternative that can assist us in improving the health sector? Well, perhaps there is, providing it doesn't deflect us away from the point of need. Uh, you know, when people are sick, um, they need to be looked after. And unlike in America, it's not a question of going through their wallet first to see whether they've got health insurance. I have the great privilege of sharing a platform with Katty Bauer um, a few months ago. She's 107 years of age. She's since died. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful woman. Her sister was uh, one of the suffragettes. Um, and um, she spoke and explained what life was like um, prior to the National Health Service. She, she reflected back to days when uh, young women who had sick babies had to beg on the streets to get a few pennies so that they could go and see a doctor. And she said that her dying breath, uh, she would fight to defend the National Health Service. So I'm all for, uh, I'm not one of these people that believes all that's correct and nothing should move. In fact, I suppose if you could characterize me, the one thing that is consistent in my life is I'm always opposed to the status quo, whatever it is and wherever it is. I always think that we should be seeking better. It should never be good enough. So I'm happy to engage in a debate about how can we utilize and run the National Health Service in a different way, providing it doesn't destroy the principles of health being there for those that need it uh, at the point of need and costing nothing. Yeah. Hi, my name is Leo. I want to say thank you for your speech. Um, you've spoken a lot about the three main parties, but what about the UK? Do you think that Nigel Farage poses a real threat? Well, in a way, I think UKIP is a manifestation of what I was saying about the disillusionment of politics. You know, it is undoubtedly a, a protest vote um, because people look and, you know, are struggling to find discernible differences between the main political parties um, and feel that nobody speaks on their behalf. Um, and so when somebody like Farage comes along and, does, uh, and starts talking in populist terms about immigration and flying the, the, the Union Jack. Well, people respond to that. And he, is he a threat? Yes, undoubtedly uh, he is a threat. Um, perhaps more so to the Conservative Party than, uh, than any of the other parties. Although <coughs> what that's tending to do at the moment is drive the, the Prime Minister further to the right because he needs to placate uh, some of his people. It's not easy being the leader of a political party. Um, but I think uh, what will happen with UKIP, I certainly think that they'll do well in Europe because there's a kind of um, anti-Europe feeling about it, even though, you know, because people want to blame somebody. Things are bad and somebody's got to be to 
play, so why not the Europeans? Um, so I think they'll do well in the European elections. Um, and whether they'll actually make a breakthrough in the um, general election next uh, May, I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, but they may call sufficiently for, you know, uh, Conservative MPs or for, for Liberal MPs to, to lose their uh, seats. And incidentally, I'm not dismissing the impact that uh, they will have within Labour strongholds, because the issue, uh, the issue of immigration is top of every uh, poll that we do and that anyone else do. People are concerned. No wonder if you pick newspapers up like the Daily Mail or the Express or the Sun, you know, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd not sleep at night because of the, the hordes advancing upon us. Um, and the truth is that it is an issue that has to be addressed. And people have to engage in that debate. You might recall Gordon Brown in the last election. He, he was confronted by a woman, I think it was up in Rochdale, and he... Uh, his microphone was still on when he got into the taxi and he said, oh, that stupid woman. And this stupid woman had simply asked a question that lots and lots of ordinary work people, white working class people, were asking about immigration. And if you don't address those issues, then uh, you leave a vacuum. You leave a vacuum not only for UK, but much more sinister for the BNP and the English Defence League. And it's important that we don't <coughs> leave that vacuum, that we answer people's concerns and we deal with those concerns. Many of the accusations about migrant workers and immigration are just false and we need to challenge them. Whilst at the same time, dealing with the concerns. And most of the concerns, it was interesting, it was at the T I was at the TUC General Council this morning where we received a presentation on immigration, again, top of the poll in people's concerns, and what people's views were. They were it was fascinating, some of the kind of stuff that was being said. But the concern centre, in, in, in a way, around two areas. One is that all these people are coming in here and undercutting British workers' jobs, working for less money, and therefore uh, British workers can't get jobs. Uh, because they're being undercut. And that, to a large extent, is true in many of our industries. But the way to deal with that is not to attack migrant workers or create divisions. It's to highlight the fact that the bosses, back to your question about uh, you know, building their profits through criminal uh, activities, that the, the company <coughs> are using work and abusing the system of pay. So you have to strengthen collective bargaining. You have to strengthen minimum rates of pay within our uh, specific sectors. If that happened and was properly enforced, there would be less concern about migrant workers. The other issue is about housing. Oh, they all come in and they just jump the housing queue and they get housed. Well, that's not true. That's a myth per per perpetrated by the right-wing press uh, and, and the fascists within our midst. But it is, a, it is a problem that there isn't enough houses to go around. So if you build houses, if you build the million houses or more that uh, Labour are talking about, and there isn't a housing shortage anymore, affordable to rent, affordable to buy, then the argument about, well, they're pinching our houses, doesn't come in. And research shows that that then completely reduces the concerns about uh, uh, migration. And so people, uh, parties like UKIP and that have to be challenged. I mean, if any of you ever get an opportunity, do go, do go into the policies of UKIP. I mean, these are mad. <laughs> <laughs> they are genuinely, some of the policies would, would make the hair stand up on the back of your neck in relation to what their beliefs are outside of Europe and, and, and immigration. But yeah. Uh, a protest and a protest vote because people perceive a vacuum. Let me tell you a story about Barking and, and Dagenham. There were 12 <coughs> BNP councils in, in, in Barking. 12 BNP councils. And they're coming up to the council elections two years ago and they were hoping to gain another 12 seats um, 
which would have given them control. Can you imagine a, 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 a fascist organization whose policies are, uh, are, are rooted in evil bigotry, controlling a council within our capital city? And they were very confident they would do that. Fortunately, the Labour Party went onto the streets, I did it myself, knocking on doors, asking people to question, and a predominantly white working class um, uh, uh, electorate said, well, nobody speaks on our behalf. Nobody speaks for us. Everybody's worried about ethnic minorities or this group or that group. Nobody speaks to us. And they get everything. And of course, when you speak to people and you point out, well, that's wrong. This is the truth. You start, people start to listen. And when people say, we speak for everyone, black and white, we want more houses, better houses, better jobs, protection of our education system, then you're speaking to them and you're filling the vacuum. And do you know what happened? Do you know how many extra council seats the BNP won? Not a single one. Do you know how many they lost? All 12 that they had. So from being in a position where they thought they were going to take control of the council, they were wiped out because we filled the vacuum. That's what's happening with UCAP. And as soon as genuine, decent, progressive people fill a vacuum and expose what they are, but also uh, deal with the concerns of ordinary people, then I, I, I think they'll be one of those aberrations that we'll talk about in years to come. Oh, we have time for one more question. Let's make it a good one. Do you think uh, the neoliberal consensus is necessarily incompatible with addressing income inequality? So George Osborne recently, uh, he increased the minimum wage. Countries like Germany have a corporatist model where unions work with employers and they have wages which are in the OECD pretty high. So I guess the question is, what do you think is specifically wrong with the consensus right now? Well, it hasn't worked. I mean, it's brought about the crisis that we are currently in. The neoliberal liberal consensus that dominates the, the global economy came crashing to earth because it wasn't rooted in sustainable growth. It's interesting you mention Germany because in Germany, their approach to social responsibility, their approach to investment, in manufacturing is dramatically different from our own experiences in Britain. You have to go back to uh, the Thatcher Reagan axis of 1980 when uh, the creation of this new concept of neoliberalism and, and, and monetarism and laissez-faire was um, uh, what first gained uh, traction. And what happened was the manufacturing base in Britain has been absolutely decimated. <coughs> completely decimated. The, the UK was like a car boot sale. There was a big sign saying UK for sale. Come on in. And they did. They came in, bought factories up, closed them down. Didn't close the market down. The market's still as powerful as ever. Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company, their biggest market and their most profitable market is UK. Ford UK. Do you know how many cars they make in Ford UK? No. Not a single Ford car is made here in the UK. Do you know how many they used to make? Hundreds of thousands. So the concept of lack of investment, <coughs> driven by the laissez-faire attitude of Thatcher and Reagan at the time, drove out manufacturing and put an imbalance. You've all heard, uh, when, you, when you've been studying your economic lessons and everything else, you've heard that, or, or everyone talking about, well, we must rebalance the economy. What they mean by that? is, my God, where's our manufacturing base gone? We can't all be service workers. We've got to make something. And so they're talking about doing that. But what happened for 30 years? New Labour was the same. Tony Blair was exactly the same. You remember Margaret Thatcher famously said when she was asked, what's your greatest, uh, what do you think your greatest achievement was? She answered by saying New Labour. Um, because, of course, Tony Blair follows exactly that path. <coughs> and it came tumbling down. The vagaries of the financial markets, global financial markets, so of course, have imp impacted everywhere. But the areas that have, uh, have been the best are the likes of Germany because they invested 
massively in their manufacturing industry. They embrace their trade unions. Look at the difference between uh, the German government's attitude towards trade unions and our current government's attitude towards trade unions. You know, we're the enemy within here, whereas in Germany they are embraced. So your point about what is a balance is a perfectly legitimate one. And that's about recognizing the roles, recognizing that the wealth creation. This, I made the point in my speech about 65% of our GDP used to be paid to workers. What did workers do with that? Well, they spent it and created more wealth and stimulated demand and therefore created economic growth. It's now down to 53%. That's an enormous drop. And that's why there's no sustainable growth within our economy. The government is saying, oh, yeah, we've turned the corner. <coughs> no, we haven't. I mean, you say that George Osborne um, increased the minimum wage. He, he actually didn't, but it was dead interesting that he called for an increase in the minimum wage to go up to £7. Why? Because he knows that the current situation, can uh, the growth within our nation can only be, can only be sustained if there is demand, and demand can only come when people have got more money in their pockets and when people are seeking demand. So the concept, I'm not seeking to destroy capitalism. I mean, Ed Miliband talks about um, responsible capitalism. I'm not sure whether that's an oxymoron, but we'll leave that for another <laughs> debate. The point is, I recognize that um, within a consumer society, there has to be a situation where profit is made. We work with companies all over the place where we're desperate for them to be competitive and, uh, and, and be profitable because it benefits everybody. But the terminology neoliberal is effectively to demonstrate that there is no, especially when you're talking about American and British capital who have similar characteristics, there is no long-term sustainability. There was lots of people predicting the collapse of, um, of the system uh, years before it happened. You know, it was in 2007 that the actual strike, the dramatic reduction in business investment. In fact, if you look, if you get a chance to look at some statistics, you'll see uh, from 1980, uh, the, the media will often want to talk to you about uh, the terrible strikes and the damage it does to the company. They say nothing about the one strike that is deeply damaging to our nation, and that's a strike in business investment. For 30 years, it's been on a down slump. In 2007, it dropped dramatically, which led to the crash. And so that is why I use the terminology neoliberalism and, and the orthodoxy that has, has dominated. But I don't dispute and, and, and dismiss the need for proper entrepreneurial spirit to be encouraged, growth, within our nations, but it has to be on the basis of fair, equitable uh, distribution of that wealth, which leads to a more civilized society. As we sit here tonight, and I said that in a way you're privileged, you've got choices. Well, I'm pretty privileged as well. You know, I, I earn a very, very good salary and I have a good living. But as we sit here, there are people, hundreds of thousands of young people, one million, without any jobs at the moment. No future. You know, you get up every morning, you've got a, a vision, you've got something to do, you've, you, you, you've got a, a, a direction to go in, you can enjoy the cultural life that exists here. These are individuals who get up every morning, and I often ask politicians, what do you think those young people do from the minute they wake up to the minute they go to sleep? This is after weeks and weeks and months of writing to hundreds of people and being told there's nothing for them. How debilitating is that? There's one million of your contemporaries out there suffering like that. And there's others who are being ripped off with low pay, zero hour contracts. That's the type of Britain that we've got at the moment. The food bank Britain, the Wonga Britain, where loan sharks earning up to 4,000% uh, uh, interest because people are desperate to feed themselves, desperate to feed the kids. That's the Britain that we are in at the moment. That's the Britain that neoliberalism has brought us to. And I just urge all of you to reject that and use your undoubted skills to make certain that we can do something.